There's a reason that Hebrews says what it says. Right. That we that we have to remember to gather together. Totally. And I, I think that's especially important in today's world that's technologically driven and where we are more likely to text people in our own household than we are to have a face to face conversation with yeah. them. And that is creating great problems for us. And I, I happen to believe that the Bible was prophetic in many ways. So I believe that it was prophetic to us knowing that this day would come, knowing that the urge to just take everything to a technological level would be strong. Right. And I think the reminder that we must be present with one another physically right. is a really important reminder. And, and it's a reminder for all of us that outside of all of the flaws of the church that we have to get together. And I think that's something we really, really wanted to talk about why we needed to get together. Yeah. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Joyce Reese. And I'm Jessica De Sabatino. This is a show where we want to make deep theology easily understood and applied to our real lives. Here we discuss many things like the importance of story, kingdom theology of mission, the table of Jesus, becoming fully human, and much more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. Here we are again, ready to kick it in a new direction. We've been just covering a bunch of weeks on justice, a bunch of episodes, and now we're going to try and tackle kind of big broad strokes about church and you know what the purpose is of the church and why we gather and those kinds of things over the next few episodes. Right. But today we want to talk a bit about church and belonging. I think that's a really important place to begin. Yeah, absolutely because I think there is this predominant thought in our culture that while people really like Jesus, they're not really sure about church and especially when you speak about the church as an institution or a Religious organization, yeah. yeah. There's a high level of distrust mm -hmm. around institutional, sort of programmatic, historical church. And for good reason. Yeah, totally. Like, let's be honest. And you don't even have to be First Nations to have a high level of distrust. Although I think, you know, Indigenous people in Canada have extra <coughs> loaded reasons for distrusting the institution. You look back at some of the history, say, with residential schools or whatever. But... There are really huge issues, particularly among young adults, millennials in Canada, that have been identified in terms of how they feel about local churches or the church as an institution. Yeah, and I think in general, there is a really, in our society outside of the church, people have mistrust for authority. Right. So I think when people think of the church, they think of authority. And I think really, if we're honest, I think most people view themselves being in a flat sort of yeah. plain, you know, organizations have gone to flat hierarchy. So there's no, and, and I think the church represents, historically has represented very much a hierarchy and authority. And right. I think people, especially millennials, don't know what to do with that. I think that's a really important point. I hadn't actually thought about the impact culturally in terms of authority and distrust. I think that also speaks a little bit to relativism. Yeah, in our but, culture. Yeah, and I think I think though the internet really has pushed this agenda forward in in ways that we can't even understand because I think now you can see this even if you take away the church we're not even talking about the church let's just say in politics people can get on their computers and say whatever smack they want to say about whoever is the prime minister or the president or the senator or the whatever you know people and and that is my innate right as a as a North American as someone who lives in a free and democratic country. When you bring that into the church, though, it becomes something else. Like, it, it just becomes a little ugly to have people online talking smack about their pastor or some elder in the church. Yeah. That is the kind of world we live in, yeah. and it has affected how people think about the church, how they engage with the church, and what they do with, with the church. And on one level, like, it's actually a good problem to have because it will make church leaders have to be like Jesus and held right. accountable 
Right. There is no more just blind. You can't just say, I am a leader. Like, that is is my title. I am a calling and anointing. I am the authority. Honor me. Right. I, I also think, though, there's been sort of a backlash towards that in the culture of honor. And maybe you've heard of that. I've had pastors speak about it and... And to me, it always makes me a little bit nervous. I think we swung the pendulum almost too far where we're afraid to actually call people in accountability yeah. on the account of being honorable to one another. And I think it has allowed a celebrity mindset to, um, to pervade. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say is the celebrity culture in the church is not reflective <laughs> of New Testament leadership. And when you think about Jesus as a servant leader... And, you know, the whole foot washing kind of image that we're left with. I mean, John's gospel is the one that tells the Last Supper differently. We always think of the Last Supper image of the bread and the cup, which is true and important in terms of our understanding of sacrament. We're going to come to that in maybe three or so episodes. But, you know, I, I think it's quite profound that Jesus's legacy, if you will, that John leaves us in terms of how we understand covenant and covenantal leadership is that Jesus gets down and washes the feet of the disciples. Right. I, I think in some ways we've trivialized that passage. We've said, okay, so when we have like a ceremony or like some kind of retreat, we wash <laughs> each other's feet and that's right. powerful. But, I, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not dissing that. I'm just, I, I think that it's a bigger issue than that. Yeah. I think what it tells us is that we cannot have the celebritization of either the clergy or in any hierarchy in the church. And I think we've got to be called back to Hebrews that says that we're the priesthood of all believers. So we actually, so in actuality, I think the New Testament church is set up perfectly for the 21st century. Right. In a flat kind of thinking of authority. That's not to say that we don't believe in authority because we do. Right. But it's a different kind of (laughs) leveraging of call or gift or passions it's less, I have the title, therefore, and more of, I'm going to try and lead in the way of Jesus, which is get low. Right. And the, the culture of honor, I think, is important as long as we are honoring one another. Right. As long as the least among us is honored yeah. as much as the person with the microphone. Right. The mutuality. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I do think, I think if we scratched on that a little bit and we pushed on it a little bit, I think we honor people with three or four gifts. And we leave other people to somehow figure out how they're going to honor the people with three or four gifts. Totally. My husband, Callum, it makes me laugh because a bunch of years ago we visited a church and our friends were a part of it and we were there for the weekend. And we were struck by how different it was than our community, our little congregation in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Obviously, it's going to look different. But I asked Callum later, like, how would you describe it? He's like, oh, that was Martini Church. And I was like, what? And he's just like, oh, it's just all beautiful people, everybody uh, looking all lovely and uh, with their hipster beards and tattoos and man buns and, you know, everybody that was up front, everybody that was public looked like they could have been on television. And he just, he said, "I, I just don't love it. Long story short is we ended up pastoring at that church, (laughs) which was probably quite good for us in terms of our own reverse bias. But nonetheless, we had to find a way to make the playing field a little bit more even, right? And not aim for the things in the culture. And I think that's something that actually resonates. I'll give you an example. A couple weeks ago, it was Mother's Day. I guess that's more than a couple weeks, but whatever. It was recent. And we had um, some young adult friends of ours... (coughs) visit the our congregation that day came with their parents and we know these young adults really well anyways there was an awkward moment where one of our worship leaders kind of got lost in you know his like heart engagement with God and he became overwhelmed and could no longer lead and then the people that were you know kind of supporting him or whatever were newer and didn't have the confidence to just like start to play something instrumental or like deal with this awkward moment This is the pastor's nightmare. I'm just going to say an aside. You actually, (laughs) what you want to do is lay down in the fetal position or hide. Right. But you can't. You You have to, you have to, you have to soldier on, soldier. Yeah. So the next day, so Monday, I sent um, my friend Megan, who was there, one of the visiting young adults, I sent her a text just say, hey, loved having you with us yesterday. I know you're visiting because your mom was there, but it was really special for me too. And then she wrote back and she said, oh, I absolutely loved it. And so Callum said, hey, ask her if I can call her and get some, like, objective feedback. Right. So he called her. he's a brave man. Yeah. 
he called her. He said, look, just tell me, like, how you felt about Sunday and, like, outside eyes, little critical insight. And then he asked her about the awkward moment. And she was like, oh, no, 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 we loved that. Yeah. And he was like, what? Why? She said, because it was so real. So authenticity is so valued mm -hmm. that even if it's messy, mm -hmm. even if it's like, I think, I think millennials will actually be more drawn to what feels authentic, even if it's not very polished. Right. Than they would be to celebrity culture and perfect performance. Right. I mean, I think that speaks to a large proportion swath. swath swath of them i think there are still people that like that value high performance and value high production and there's nothing wrong with that right. high production doesn't actually isn't antithetical to authenticity but i think what we're saying is that there must also be authenticity right and if you only see one without the other if you are a beautiful worship leader we're not we're not mad at you right please don't go get mauled by a tiger so that you can be more authentic <laughs> right so we're not saying that it's an either or but we are what we are saying is i think the culture is looking for really authentic people yeah. who actually believe in the priesthood of all believers and who somehow can communicate that and that there would be some the level of vulnerability like you and i we get this Every time I speak, every time. Common comment at the end of every every speak that Jessica and I do, we hear people say, wow, you're just so real. We're so glad you've come to us. You're like a breath of fresh air because you actually, you, you're actually so vulnerable. You're so authentic. They keep saying this kind of thing. And then I think, what is everyone else doing? Are is everyone else lying? Of... <laughs> is everyone else lying? I don't get it. <laughs> All a bunch of lies. I remember though, when I first started... When I first started preaching a little bit, you know, and my parents would sometimes be in the crowd. And I mean, I would just share myself and share my struggles. And I have so many struggles, so it's not hard. It's not like it's like a very deep well for me to draw from. <laughs> Every week there are more and more struggles. And I can remember my mom saying to me, Jessica, you can't be that. You can't put yourself out there. You have to. Like, I, and, and I understood. I mean, I understand this as a mom. You, you, this is your child and you want to protect them. But I actually think what it shows is it's is a difference between how generations communicate, say, right? Yeah. So I think increasingly, and I think probably up to our generation, we're more comfortable with saying, yeah, this is what I'm struggling with. So I'm up here with a microphone and I am not saying in any way, shape or form that I have this all figured out. Right. I'm saying that we're journeying together yeah. and we're going to look at what the word of God says and it's going to help us to get better and stronger together. Yeah. And there's an appropriate vulnerability yes, when you're talking to a yeah, crowd absolutely. or all of those kinds of things. But we are never going to be the talking heads who speak in abstracts about following hard after the Lord, but not talking about what that looks like in real time. Thus, the title of the podcast, Down to Earth, because we wanted to talk about how to make our faith easily accessible and on the ground and lived in real time, right? right. But there was this important study done a few years ago, a yeah. hemorrhaging faith study. Yeah, I was... You know a little bit more about it than me. Hemorrhaging faith study was done uh, in conjunction with a bunch of partners, but the EFC, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, sponsored, it, sponsored right? this yeah. study. Yeah, And I was sitting on the board of the EFC at the time, and it was a really important study because the question they were asking is, why are so many young adults leaving the church? Thus, hemorrhaging faith. Right. Why are we bleeding out, basically? Right. And the study was done a number of years ago, but I think it still bears a lot of relevance and at the end of the day, they looked at they looked at all denominations, so not just Protestant, but they looked at Catholic and all kinds of denominations, every, every, yeah, mm -hmm, every kind United, of denomination yeah. out there. And they found a number of things that were the reasons why young adults were leaving. And some of them were very predictable, like issues of sexuality. That was a big issue. And so it reminded us, I think, that we that we have to talk about that elephant in the room. We can't just like put her head in the sand. There, yeah. I would like to put my head in the sand and pretend it's not there, but we can't. And then, but I think the most important one, at least from my perspective, was this issue of authenticity and if their parents were really living out the gospel at home. So then young adults Translated. would often would often serve the Lord up to a point of like, I don't know, like in the 80 percentage percentile. If their parents just sort of went to church as an add-on or pretended they were spiritual when they got to church, and then didn't really live it out, well, then that created a significant decline. They also found that the idea of mentorship, which I think is going to really be important for us as we talk about the, why the church actually matters, why the gathering of different yeah. generations and different bunches of people matters. They found that if young adults had mentors, had 
had people in their lives that this really, really mattered. And in fact, another study that sort of came out around the same time as hemorrhaging face said that every person who was in the church needed five other people outside of their immediate family who would speak into their life. And if they would have those five people, it would it exponentially increased the chances of okay. their survival of faith. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I mean, I made this a practice wherever I go, I'm asking people, who are your five people? Who are your five people? Who are your five people? And then I'm asking, conversely asking older folks or even millennials themselves, who do you have? Who are your five people? Right. And one thing on that, that came out in the study, if I can remember correctly, I'm just kind of Wiki Joyce, but I think that the study, the hemorrhaging faith study, showed that the the bleed wasn't happening when young adults went to university, which is no. what had been assumed. The bleed right. was happening around grade six, yeah. when kids transitioned to middle school. If they didn't, if they weren't known by name by two adults that were not related to them in the life of the church and had some sort of sense of belonging to those two adults, they did not retain their faith into yeah. high school. Yeah, and I think of my life back as a youth pastor. You know, I did this when this study came out. It pretty much it rocked me, because I thought now we have empirical evidence. Now we understand. Now we know we can do something about this. Right. So I made a list of all the kids that had been in my youth group, and I'd pastored hundreds of kids in youth groups, and pretty much I, I made a list of kids who really had connection with other adults, and then other kids that were sort of Perfect. pretty much yeah, you could you could cut it with a knife. Yeah, even kids that were involved in the church, if they didn't have connection I knew yeah. you know I knew their lives quite intimately so yeah. I knew they didn't have connection to other adults pretty much you could cut it with a knife and say yeah I understand why this person which is why the legacy I, I had the privilege of working <laughs> with a guy named Eldon Wright a bunch of years ago and you know oh, Eldon Shout yeah out to Eldon Wright yeah like a life or youth pastor who never said like oh well I just didn't climb in a ladder yeah. he felt really strongly about his investment in youth and he was smart right so he developed a discipleship <laughs> program that would basically put kids from grade 8 to 12 through their first year of Bible school. And it was all centered around small group discipleship. So you had a, an adult that would lead groups of, you know, four to eight kids. And I can tell you, in years of pastoring, and we had 1,200 students under our kind of remit of responsibility, the ones who did that discipleship program retained their faith and went on to do great things for God, by and large. It wasn't because of the first year Bible school that they got. It was because they had significant relationship with those leaders. Right. Which will come, we'll come to this in a minute because it's very, very important that we think about both sides of it, that we invest with kids and that we make sure that kids are welcome, right, in our gatherings. But it also has to do with our gifts being present. And right. so when we think about church life and belonging and we're looking for what's authentic and we want to have a posture of, being real as a community so that there can be <coughs> resonance in the culture. I think we need to think about how that translates in real time. There are four, four primary toxins that came out of that hemorrhaging faith report that they identified that kept young adults from engaging with the church. And these were the four toxins, hypocrisy, judgment, exclusivity, and failure. And some of that failure is moral failure and the disillusionment that came with it. I would say <laughs> hypocrisy and failure were like tied. Yeah. And I would also say that judgment and exclusivity were tied, right? right. Yeah. So it's like two sides of the same coin. So what they wanted in essence was authenticity and inclusion. Right. And in some ways I think authenticity inoculates us from failure in some ways. Cause I think we get, yeah. if we're authentic and we say, listen, I'm, I'm struggling as much as you. Right. I'm not saying it inoculates us from moral failures, but from the everyday life failures that you just have. Yeah. I think when we're not authentic, that actually, it sets us on this crazy high platform that we can never, we actually never can attain to. Yeah. And it, it puts us in a sets position to fail. Yeah. yeah, totally. It's like an, that stool's going to topple. And I think for some young people, when they see that, they try to emulate perf what they see as perfection that really is not true. And then it seems like a mountain that they'll never be able to climb, and then they give up. Right. And what's the point? And it, it seems so false compared to all the stuff that they would hear in the culture, right? Right. So we've set up this dichotomy, in a sense, that's created a real unhealth, ill health, I guess yeah. is the way to say it, because uh, they don't know what real, authentic, on the ground, following Jesus looks like. Right. And I think, you know, like I think about my own life and think, the greatest compliment somebody can give me is not that I have it all figured out, but that my heart 
seems like I really want to know Jesus. Yeah. That's like, that's all I want people to be able to see in me that I, that I actually am striving every day to know him more. Right. And, and hopefully that I, I think when that becomes the posture of the church, it breaks down a lot of walls and barriers and it actually creates a platform for why we must gather together. Yeah. And, and, you know, I also think in this, in this idea, when I, sort of made a list of who fell away from the Lord and who didn't. It was very clear to me that students that were quite gregarious, that could go out and find people to mentor them, they fared much better right. because they were the people saying, hey, can I come over to your house, Mrs. Johnson? Can I come over to your house for sausages today? They right. were those kinds of kids. Yeah. They weren't shy, Type they weren't, A's. Right? They might not even have been type A's, but they had a lot of energy. They were the kind of kids that, you know, you were not going to hold them. They were going to know everybody in the church and that's right. how, how it was. The kids that struggled, though, were the ones that are just like probably a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more quiet, a little bit more shy. And that's why we need the church, because we have to have a place for people like that. We can't say that you're second class and your spirituality is going to be is like less than because you can't go out and find your five. And we have to find ways to create the belonging, to find not just each other. hope, fingers crossed, yeah. that that'll happen. Now, we've pastored enough fears that we... We've heard people regularly say this statement. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Right. How do you respond when people say stuff like that? Well, I mean, I think there's always something underneath that, right? I think I think there's always hurt underneath that. Yeah. And I think we got to listen to each other's stories because I think usually when people say that it is real hurt, it's significant hurt. It's it's been judgment. I mean, I have friends who were pastors and who were so hurt in churches and they say things like this. Yeah. But a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, we were talking about it, and he said, it's kind of like, you know, if you if you met a couple who are getting married, and you say, well, I really like him, but I I hate his wife. Like, if the husband were to hear that, and he's a good husband, he's going to say, well, really, we can't really have relationship, because if you hate my wife, right. I'm not having an exclusive relationship, because this is my wife. This is yeah. the one that I love. Right. And... I think that's what we're saying when we say, well, we love Jesus, but we hate the church. We're saying, Jesus, I like you, but I hate your wife. Because God tells us all throughout the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, that the church is the bride of Christ. And so we have to find a way to reconcile our hurt with the truth that the church is the bride of Christ. Right. And that also would involve having a good look at the narrative of like what the church is for. Right. Right. If you come at church with a consumptive cultural value, right? Like, so our culture, I'll give you an example, tell you like, okay, you're going to go to university, so figure out who's got the best program and, you know, for your interests and your passions and your field, oh, you're good at math, okay, you want to try to get into the University of Waterloo. You're good at law, you might want to go to Wilfrid Laurier or UBC or whatever, right? You're good at medicine, go to McGill or, right? Like you find your niche and go there. Sorry for all the schools I didn't mention. Everybody's known for something, right? And so we have that kind of approach to getting an education. But I think we also translate that and we have that approach to like why we don't want to belong to a church because it doesn't meet our needs, right? Like, And so you get a lot of, it's funny that judgment is an issue for millennials, mm-hmm. but then a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of times the reason they're not a part of a church community is because they have a tremendous amount of judgment. Yes. So it's like a, it's a bit of a catch 22. You get caught in. And I have people say to me like, oh, they've heard the Hebrews, you know, in the King James, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, right? Like the idea that Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't give up getting together. I like how Peterson says it in the <coughs> message. He says, Let's see how inventive we can be. Right there, I love that. In encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Like there's a reason that we're supposed to get together, right? And some of that is rubbing off on one another. I have a bunch of people I know. I mean, you, you and I have been around long enough that There was a movement, some of you will be completely unaware because you're too young, but there was a movement called the Emergent Church Movement. Oh, yes. I've read many books in this. Right. I accidentally got published (laughs) in the Emergent Church Movement. I went to a dialogical conference. This was like a big deal to go to conferences where you didn't have big talking heads, but you had dialogue and, and you signed a waiver that the things you said could be, you know, 
recorded or <laughs> used in some way. Well, I signed that waiver because I went to that thing. And, and then, uh, I don't know, like 18 months later or something, I went to speak at a conference in Vancouver. And the guy who was introducing me, Darian Kovacs, he got up and he's like, so really blessed to have Joyce here and da 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 and, and just so you know, like hot off the press, new book that she's published in and it's out in the foyer. And I was like, what? <laughs> So then I walked up and he thought I was joking. This is on the platform. I was like, give me that book. And I looked at it and sure enough, there's my name on the front cover with a bunch of other lovely people. And I just held it up to everyone. I said, do not buy this. I did not authorize this. I do not know what this is. Then later realized, ah, it was some things I said at the conference that they made into a chapter in the book, which kind of upset me. But Emergent was known for like being a little bit upsetting to the established church and doing things their own way. Right. And I think in some ways, whenever you have a shakeup like that, it's a good shakeup. I think it causes us to have to go back and reevaluate what we believe and why we believe it. You know, they they would constantly challenge why we do what we do. Right. Why stand up and sit down and clap and sing fast songs and slow songs and have a talking head and never have a QA and a and you know like yeah. why do we do it this way why why the formula and so the big deconstruct happened through yeah. the emergent church the pendulum swung a little too far <laughs> in my opinion i agree whenever you get the big deconstruct happen and you never build anything back in or you never get the essential core principles you're going to end up with the difficulty mm-hmm. and i think sometimes we have so much passion to do things new and different and other that we threw the baby out with the bathwater right you know, there's like 2,000 years of history with the church, Big C, yeah. that if you look at core practices, core values, and we're going to come to this even in the next podcast talking about in the next episode, like why the worship gathering, you got to examine it from a big biblical lens and a big historical lens, and then don't chuck it all out the window. Right. There's a reason that Hebrews says what it says, right. that we that we have to remember to gather together. Totally. And I, I think that's especially important in today's world that's technologically driven and where we are more likely to text people in our own household than we are to have a face-to-face conversation with yeah. them. And that is creating great problems for us. And I, I happen to believe that the Bible was prophetic in many ways. So I believe that it was prophetic to us, knowing that this day would come, knowing that the urge to just take everything to a technological level would be strong. Right. And I think the reminder that we must be present with one another physically right. is a really important reminder. And, and it's a reminder for all of us that outside of all of the flaws of the church that we have to get together. And I think that's something we really, really wanted to talk about why we needed to get, to get together. together. You know, can I throw in one other thing? A bunch of years ago, um, A guy named Todd Hunter was leading the Vineyard Church Movement in the U.S., and he got an idea. This was around, just slightly ahead of the Emergent Church Movement. And so he said to the Canadian director and the British director of the Vineyard Movements in those nations, look, let's send your best, get them all together in California, and we're going to have three days where they can just dialogue. So with some heavyweights that'll shape them that shaped that generation. So he thought about investment in young leaders and he, so Gary Best was leading the vineyard in Canada at that time. And he sent three of us, my friend, Jer, my friend, Albert and me. And then the UK sent six guys and the U S had 11. So we had 20 of us in a room, get this with Dallas Willard, Hmm. Brian McLaren Hmm. and Stanley Grenz. And I of course was the only woman. It was one of those hot times, like, here we go, right? Anyway, we had these three days to talk to these guys and really unpack what leadership looked like in the (coughs) church, in our generation, and whatnot. Anyway, I think it was day two. um, Dallas got up and he said, so I'd like to have a conversation this morning about the fact that Joyce has the hardest job in the room. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud, we're going to do the woman thing? Like, that's just annoying. And he said, and I'm not talking about her being a woman. Well, then he had my attention. Like, well, what is he talking about? And he said, I'm talking about the fact that all of you are church planting except Joyce. She's the only one that has to go and speak to the established church. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how much more easy it would be to, in a sense, bail and start new. Now, this isn't slagging church planting. I think it's super, super important. I'm a big fan of church planting. I have church planted and hope to again in my future, but... He was saying, look, don't just jump ship because 
we're going to do it differently. We don't like how it's been done, so we're going to do it differently. He was trying to say, find a way to be rubbing off on one another, be inventive, and have influence on one another. And you can't do that if you quit gathering together. So even if you just say, I'm going to go somewhere else and gather with some like-minded people, and then you end up with homogenous church, right? Which I don't think is that good for us. Right. Because I think one body, many parts... The Bible is really clear about that. Yeah. We need each other. I, I am a big fan of churches with multi-generations, yeah. multicultural. In fact, I'm just finishing my thesis right now about the importance of a really heterogeneous kind of community. community. Yeah. Yeah, where, where we're pushing back on the homogenous principal unit. So I think this was the HPU, the homogenous principle, was something that came up in the 70s. Yeah. And Donald McGavern was the first person to say that, hey, listen, I think we would do better in church. And I think the heart was good, right? That I think we would get more people coming to Jesus if we'd all be similar and we wouldn't have to work out our differences. The problem with it, though, is that if you fast forward the HPU and many of our churches took that on and ran with it. Okay, yeah. let's get Billy Bob, who is like 52 and works a white collar job. Let's get all the Billy Bobs together and have a church for Billy Bob. And let's get all the cowboys together and have a church for cowboys. Yeah. The problem, all the athletes together, church right. for athletes, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The pro, there's a couple of problems with it. It created major segregation problems. And probably more so in America than in Canada, but it did create major segregation problems. And it also created problems for people that are in a very small subculture. So what do you do with the person that is really into, I don't I don't know, like... Comic-Con. Yeah, or, or, and there's only four of them in their city, so, th- so there's just <laughs> right. no place for them. And so they would come to churches with that were endeavoring to really push the homogenous principle forward. Right. And it created tension. And pastors would say, well, it's just not a church for everybody. This is not a church for it, so it's not a church for you. Right. But then where was it a church for those people? Right. And and so then I think we pushed people away. And in a very individualistic culture, I th- I think... What it, it fed did, our it could, consumerism. Yeah. And it same, also... Same. Well, we also have millennials now who are very... they. You don't want to be Billy Bob. You want to be yourself. You, right. You're very And the high value yourself. on inclusion means right. we don't want to all look same, same. Right. So I, I think we're coming into a place in the 21st century where we're saying, no, we need a less conformity, more uniqueness. And I actually think that that fits very well in a biblical narrative that says that there's one body but many parts and that we celebrate our individual traits. Now, is that harder work in a church? Absolutely. Because it means that the church can no longer be the social convener. The church actually has to be what the church was there for, and that's to create spiritual growth. And I think that's a much more difficult job than being a social club. Yep. And you know, one thing that's really important to think through is some of the churches that sprang up, they might have been homogenous at the beginning, but they realized over time they needed to morph. So our church, Epic Vineyard in Calgary, would be a good example of this. A couple of young youth pastors had an awakening of the Holy Spirit from two different denominational movements, were part of the emergent question asking kind of history and began a gathering that predominantly drew young adults. That was their niche. Okay, so fast forward 14, 15 years later, those young adults got married, they had a bunch of babies, and then the church looked like mid-30s something with a couple of leaders that were, you know, early 50s something, right? So we come along to pastor it nearly three years ago, and Callum said within the first year, look, what we need to pray for, he told the elders, he said, we need to pray that God miraculously sends us people that are 55 and older. Mm-hmm. Because we're missing a generation here and we absolutely need them to create vitality Mm -hmm. in the community. Now, I don't know very many pastors who are praying for the plus 55s to come, but that's what we did. And so we spent a few months praying very intentionally and even doing some fasting and asking God to send us the plus 55s. Now, we're a small church, okay? But in uh, six months, we got over 20 plus 55s just joined us out of the blue. We were like, this is a miracle. Mm-hmm. And it's changed the dynamic. Now we have grandma and grandpa people. We have a different kind of influence on our young adults and on our kids. Yeah. And it's starting to shift. So I think, you know, I keep saying to the community, we don't look like Calgary. We're not very ethnically diverse. This is an incredibly diverse eth- ethnic city. Not as diverse as, say, Toronto, but way more diverse than Vancouver. 
Mm-hmm. Vancouver is ethnically diverse. It's Chinese and Caucasian. I sort of exaggerate. So how can we represent, how can we look like the city we're in? And socioeconomic diversity. Mm-hmm. It's not as diverse as it needs to be. It's a lot of young urban professionals and a certain demographic. I don't think we have a lot of very, very rich people. We also don't have a lot of very, very poor people. I would love to see it be way more diverse. Because I think then we rub off on one another. We have to work out how we live our faith in real time Mm -hmm. and learn from each other. And that's humbling. Mm -hmm. That idea of one body, many parts comes, of course, from 1 Corinthians 12. Right. Yeah, I mean, I will never forget when we were pastoring in Toronto, people said to us when we went there, well, you'll never be able to have a socioeconomically diverse church. You're in a poor neighborhood. People who are rich will never come to your church. And I remember being so mad, like, I'll show you then. I'm going to show you how we're going to get in. <laughs> but I had no idea. I mean, we had a crack den next to our church, so I wasn't exactly sure. Like, that wasn't going to be like... With the hey, young come, urban professionals. Come on even down to, to our church, <laughs> and after church, you can have lunch and a crack den. Like, the, there wasn't really, like, a lot of marketing you could do around this. But <laughs> we just began praying for God to send us... I, I, I actually began praying, God, send us eccentric people who won't care. Right. Who just... Who who won't be worried about their car getting broken into and who will find it kind of, I don't know, like exciting. Yeah, adventurous. So I, I, I just, we began to pray about this and I will never forget one Sunday morning I'm up and I'm speaking and I look down into the crowd and <laughs> there's a homeless guy that would sit and he would always bring like a picnic lunch for church because that's what you do when you're in the middle. You bring a yeah. picnic lunch. To, right, to church. I'm really I had a guy it. bring the newspaper one time and like yeah. open it up while Wonderful. I was reading. Yeah, yeah awesome. It's really, really good for the ego. Okay, so, so the picnic anyways, lunch. this guy is sitting in our congregation eating Doritos now. Okay, so like, you know when you eat Doritos, they get everywhere. And, and the guy sitting next to him, though, is wearing, I'm pretty sure, a $25,000 $25, Armani suit. Okay, so he looks, he is uh-huh. a millionaire and he looks like a million bucks. He's sitting beside this homeless guy, and he kind of has his arm around him, like like they're friends. And and the homeless guy though is eating Doritos, but the Doritos are going everywhere. They're going like they're in the guy's beard. They're going onto the Armani suit, and I'm trying to preach, but I'm watching this picture. And really, <laughs> in that moment, I was I was um, wrecked. Yeah. Because it was a picture of the kingdom of God. That's why we need each other. Right. We There's need... no other way in culture that would ever happen. No, we need. The homeless yeah. guy sitting next to the guy who's a millionaire. And in Christ, we are equals. Yeah. And there is no better. There is no, I'm fancier. There's no, right. it was such a perfect picture of the kingdom of God. And I just. And you know, why church belonging matters. Yes. Yes. Because listen, the guy with the 25, there wasn't condescension. The guy with the $25,000 suit needed the homeless guy to remind him that life at some time doesn't need to be as complicated as he's made right. it. Yeah. And the homeless guy needed needed this guy to know that he belonged to somebody, that yeah. people cared about him, that at his funeral, nobody, people will come to it yeah. and will mourn his death when he dies. Yeah. And I, I, I am passionate about churches becoming pictures of what heaven will look like. I yeah. think that's what, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying, the kingdom of God yeah. down to earth. We're not... Listen, we're not going to go and have every tribe and every nation that's going to be like, whoa, I've never seen this before. Right. It I, should I, I be actually think we should be reaching for that now. Yeah. We should be reaching for that kind of diversity now. So maybe you're listening and you've had a conversation. Like I just had a conversation with a young adult yesterday and they said to me, well, there's just nobody who looks, there's just nobody like me who's had a, an awakening to God. Like I've had an awakening to God in our church. And I just wanted to lean across the table and say, and that, exactly, and that's exactly why you need to belong to here. Right. Because not about, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't have friends at church. You should. But if you, it can't be all same, same. It can't, and it can't be just about you. Right. It's got to okay. be about making diversity in the kingdom of God. We need people who, if you're, if you're the only one like yourself, great. Right. Perfect. You should stay right where you are. Stop so, complaining and be happy. Right. So this brings us to this text in 1 Corinthians 12, which I just want to read a handful of verses out of the whole chapter. Verse 7 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, not for the personal good. You're not given the Holy Spirit to like bless you personally, but for it being a blessing to the common good. And then verse 20, As it is, there are many parts but one body. Verse 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. 
Verse 25, so there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Like the, that picture of those two guys, right? Verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And then verse 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. So I say like, if you follow Jesus but you say you don't need the church or I hate the church or whatever that stuff is, it doesn't actually fit with the biblical narrative. Like we actually can't say, I don't need you. Right. We need one another and we right. need to be experiencing the gift of God in one another. I always like to point out that 1 Corinthians 13, which is of course the famous love chapter, is wedged smack dab in between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. It's this idea that love means <coughs> making room for the other. Love, the expression of love means laying down ourselves for the other. And I think that's the part that I wanted to, you know, kind of give a challenge to any millennials listening. I think sometimes we just, we're thinking about what we get out of it. And whether it meets our needs or whether the worship is good or whether there's any great teaching or whatever. And I just think when you don't come... And I, I say this to young adults all the time that are away from church life. When you don't come, you're actually robbing the church of your gifts. Yeah. Right? It's not just what you get. It's what you bring. Right. What your gift mix is. And and I get frustrated when it's like, oh, have we ever thought about doing evening church? Because I like to sleep in on Sunday mornings. And, you know, it just doesn't really work for me to get up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, we can't do evening church because one third of our community are elementary or preschool age children. Mm -hmm. They have to be in bed by a certain time. And so like not even <coughs> having any concern for the kids, right? That's going to impact. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a looking out of your, from yourself and saying other people matter. And my life is not just about me, but it's about the people that I'm going to impact. Yeah. And I'm going to lean into a church and all of its imperfection and all of its ugliness and I'm going to make room. Totally. Now, one heart. one thing I would like to say, just, you know, even if we've had a bit of challenge towards certain generations who maybe have it, more issues with consumerism, is I also think there's a failing in church leadership to make room for young adults to lead. Right. And I think this is a really, really serious problem. In fact, some studies are saying young adults got so overlooked that now the leadership is looking to the people that are our age in our you know, early mid I always 40s. get, I always get heard. I always get asked, you are, it's so wonderful to have you here, to have a young leader. And I'm always so thrilled about that. I think I am like the same age as presidents of countries, but all right, if you want to call me a young, young leader, leader, right. But at 40, I don't think we're young leaders anymore. No. And I'm 45. So then I go, you're a lot older I, than me, Reese. Callum likes to point out half a 90. Okay. Half a 90. Right. So when I'm thinking young leader, I'm thinking like 19. Right. Right. Like, or 21, we hired um, Jasmine to oversee kids and ministry to families. And she's, you know, just finished her third year nursing. And she's a really, really amazing young adult, young woman. But I said to her, Jazzy, why didn't you apply for this position six months ago? And she said, I just assumed you were looking for someone like my mom. Mm -hmm. And her mom is absolutely phenomenally gifted with kids, but she's in her early 50s. We're wanting to empower young leaders. And I think to be fair to young adults, there's a lot of pastors that aren't seeing them. Right. So I heard a, a quote by Tommy Barnett about 20 years ago, and I was a young adult when I read it, and it resonated with me and has stayed with me all, all of my pastoring years. He said he went to Capitol Hill a number of years, like wait, years, years ago, and he was shocked by the fact that it was 21-year-olds running the country it was right. 21 year olds running America. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, the talking heads were the talking heads, but the people doing the work were 21 years yeah. old. And he went back into his little church and realized he didn't give 21 year olds any authority because he was worried they were going to mess up the nursery ministry or the, right. And he just went back with the bee in his bonnet to empower young people to run the church. Yeah. And when that happened, everything changed. Right. Because I mean, the truth is those of us that are, um, in our middle age, we don't have as much energy. Yeah. You have, you, yeah. It, that's just a part of life. Our church is currently going through a big transition where we're saying that we're going to be laser focused on the next generation. I'll tell you what, it has created 
it's created some tension for people who are our age saying, well, yeah. it's not a church for me anymore. So I guess I won't come here. And part of that is because their generation got overlooked. So they still never got their chance. Yeah. Right. So we got to do a bit of both end, but yeah. we got to reach for the younger leaders and not just to be workhorses, no. not just to be like the setup team and the teardown team. Cause they're no, they need to be the people and, leading worship and yeah. Calling and preaching. Us to, yeah. Here's an example. Last year we had a young guy join our community, Daniel moved to Calgary and he had siblings that are in our church. So he came along and right near the very beginning, when I saw him, I felt the Holy spirit speak to my heart. Okay. And say, train that guy to preach. And I was like, Oh, that guy. Okay. But then as I got to know him, he's like the quietest dude, like 19 years old, super introverted, really, really quiet. I thought oh, I probably wasn't hearing correctly. <laughs> and I kind of ignored it and didn't pursue it. That was around April time. July got baptized. Mom and dad were visiting their missionaries in Brazil and they were visiting and baptized him in the river here in Calgary. And when he came up out of the water, same, very, very, very strong sort of urging, Holy Spirit speaking in my heart saying, train that young man to preach. So I went to him, you know, the next week and I said, hey, I just had this idea. Would you ever be interested in learning how to preach? Well, he lit right up. Yeah. I trained him all autumn and he preached for the first time in November. And it was really awesome because he got up and he was like, so... We're in this series in Colossians and I've got a, I was given this passage about always being prepared to give an answer. So I'm going to just talk about how we share Jesus. And, but he said, I'm young, I'm only 19 and I probably am going to run out of things to say after about 15 minutes, but I did pray about it and I've tried to come up with some things to say. Do you know what? One of the most amazing things Daniel did in that preach that nobody will ever forget is that he talked about his failings and the times that he'd missed sharing Jesus with others as an example of like to call us to listen better and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit more. And it was not the success stories. It was the authentic, Mm -hmm. real failing stories, right? That showed us a desire to keep reaching and listening. Yeah. It was a home run. Yeah. Like people like gave him a huge round of applause. And I've been asked several times, when da- when's Daniel preaching again, you know? And I think that's a risk for some pastors yeah. to ever give the pulpit to anybody else. Mm-hmm. I don't have that issue. I love to train the lady. But even then, there's sometimes a temptation to go, well, that person's very quiet or that person doesn't seem to have these overt gifts. And we would miss what's mm-hmm. hidden mm-hmm. because we're not making room for yeah. one body, many parts. So bring your gifts to the mix. Yep. And those of us that lead, we need to be the people that are making room for those gifts to be present, that diversity in the body of Christ. We right. need to belong to one another. Yep. Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.